Hi, I am Dr. Alexander Balan and it's my pleasure to discuss with you brain protection in neurosurgery. Brain protection is it something related to food, food supplements like vitamins, exercising, yoga or a good sleep? Of course yes, but in neurosurgery we are discussing something at the level of ves vessels and uh, brain tissue and of course interstitial. So let's discuss it by step by step. Neuroprotection describes strategies to protect neural element against uh, damage and impairment of neurologic function. One of the essentials of neuroanesthesia practice is to provide the patient with neuroprotective measures it is hoped that these measures will reduce poor neurologic outcomes like motor and sensory deficits and cognitive dysfunction resulting from inevitable surgical brain injury during neurosurgical procedures. The most common forms of brain injury during neurosurgical procedures are brain retraction incising brain tissue, removing brain tissue, and temporary vascular occlusion. Eliminating pathological brain tissue and brain retraction will inevitably lead to injury of normal brain structures. For example, uh, clamping of a carotid artery during carotid uh, endarteriectomy uh, can simulate unilateral global ischemia or even acute ischemic stroke. Here we have uh, two types of strategies like non-pharmacological and pharmacological strategies. Anesthesia related like hypothermia, induced of course, uh, normal glycemia, adequate cerebral blood uh, flow, target hemoglobin concentration, optimizing uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, osmotherapy, and related to surgery like decreasing brain tissue injury, cerebral spinal fluid drainage by in installation of some uh, drainage, limited ischemic time and embolic load reduction. And pharmacological uh, strategies like anti-ex cytotoxicity, calcium channel blockers, antioxidants, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, cell membrane stabilizers, erythropoietin, and of course anesthetics. We will discuss many of them, but not all, of course. Mild hypothermia. If you are working in a surgical room, you will feel this mild hypothermia on your skin, of course, because there is working condition for decreasing temperature. As in the surgical room are working a lot of uh, machines that are radiating some uh, head. Mild hypothermia. Mild hypothermia has been commonly classified. Uh, I mean, hypothermia has been uh, classified into three levels: like mild, moderate, and deep or severe. Mild, 32 to 35 uh, grade of Celsius. Moderate, from 32 to 28 grade of Celsius, and deep or severe, less than 28 uh, grade of Celsius. Deep hypothermia is uh, associated with circulatory arrest and was uh, previously used. Now not too much. The mechanisms of uh, presumed hypothermic neuroprotection are multifaceted and uh, mechanisms are multifaceted and include changes in various cellular uh, processes, including the ability to decrease the cerebral metabolic rate by about 10% for every degree of Celsius. Hypothermia maintains the integrity of the blood-brain barrier after ischemic insults and constricts cerebral blood vessels, and thus reducing uh, brain edema and cerebral blood volume, and decreasing, uh, as a result, intracranial pressure, which is very important. So less blood coming to the brain, less uh, flow less edema. Blood pressure control is another uh, 
element which we can control. During neurosurgical procedures, regional and global cerebral blood flow is compromised mainly due to brain retraction and surgical bleeding respectively. Cerebral blood flow is autoregulated. It is very important, but but sustain uh, in a in a normal uh, s statement. But when there is some lesions, cerebral blood flow can be deteriorated. So, cerebral blood flow sustained with a normal range of 50 to 60 milliliter per 100 gram of brain tissue per minute, and provided that. The mean arterial pressure is between uh, 50 to 100 of 50 mm of mercury and the intracranial pressure is about 10. So there is another, another uh, term like cerebral perfusion pressure which is equal uh, mean arterial uh, pressure minus intracranial pressure and normal value constitute, uh, constitute 70 to 90 millimeter of mercury. Uh, decrement in mean arterial pressure should be avoided and keep above 80 millimeter of mercury to maintain uh, cerebral perfusion pressure near 70 during neurosurgery. Data from uh, this uh, patients uh, which we work at revealed constant brain perfusion over a wide uh, cerebral perfusion perfusion pressure range and 100% incidence of ischemia when cerebral perfusion pressure fell below the lower limit of autoregulation. So maintaining uh, within uh, some limits like 70 to 90 of mean arterial of cerebral perfusion pressure is very important for maintaining a cerebral function. In conclusion, during neurosurgical procedures, moderate and severe intraoperative hypotension should be avoided, of course, and mean arterial pressure should be maintained close to the patient's baseline pressure. Elevation of mean arterial pressure could be achieved by using a combination of measures, including volume resuscitation or decreasing anesthetic uh, levels vasopressors like epinephrine or ephedrine. This one is alpha-1 and this one is combination between beta-1 and alpha-1. Agonist, of course. Agonist. Agonist. Another point is induced arterial hypertension. Induced or permissive hypertension is a technique that can achieve stable and adequate collateral cerebral perfusion pressure during neurosurgical procedures associated with localized ischemic compromise uh, of tissue of brain tissue. Use of vasopressors to raise arterial blood pressure by 20 to 40 percent to recruit cerebral collateral networks. So induced hypertension will be potentially beneficial to reduce the incidence of perioperative cerebral ischemia events during some procedures. So it is beneficial during these procedures like interventional neuroradiology procedures, temporary clipping or clamping during cerebral aneurysmal surgery or carotid endarterectomy, extracranial or intracranial bypass surgery, surgery in patients with cerebral vasospas, and surgery in patients with uh, conditions leading to significant cerebral autoregulation dysfunction. So we can use phenylephrine like 50 to 200 micrograms intravenous bolus or ephedrine 5 to 10 milligram intravenous bolus as a primary vasoconstrictors use it to raise blood pressure during induced hypertension. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist as I told you and may cause reflex bradycardia so be aware and you can have close to you some atropine like or glycopyrrolate if it is available at your hospital. 
So other sympathomimetic agents have been used to induce hypertension, particularly in the intensive care unit like dopamine, dobutamine, and vasopressin. Used not too much. Normal glycemia, another compartment we have to discuss, as perioperative hyperglycemia may occur in diabetic patients as well as non-diabetic patients. In non-diabetic patients, hyperglycemia exists in two forms like stress-induced hyperglycemia and glucose variability. Perioperative hyperglycemia results from responses activated by surgery or trauma induced. Then it include uh, an increase in the stress hormones such as catecholamines, uh, cortisol and glucagon. Conditions uh, that providing conditions for tissue recuperation. Perioperative hyperglycemia leads to unfavorable neurologic and non-neurological outcomes after various neurosurgical procedures. For example, in carotid endarterectomy, patients with operative uh, day glucose more than 11 millimol per liter were uh, two to four times more likely to experience perioperative stroke, transient ischemic attack, and even death. So, conducted two many studies that blood glucose level more than uh, 7.2 and 8.4 are the time uh, at the time of clipping of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm for example are associated with long-term changes in cognition and gross neurological dysfunction so there are difference between administering uh, insulin in patient for elective neurosurgery and for urgent surgery However, the data, most evidence, uh, to date, most uh, evidence uh, cannot support intensive uh, insulin therapy with tight glucose control in neurosurgical population during the perioperative period. So, tight control uh, of glucose has been shown to cause much higher incidence of severe hypoglycemic episodes, stroke, myocardial infarction, and even death. For example, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and uh, American Diabetes Association has recommended that treatment should be initiated at the threshold of more than 10 millimolar per liter, preferably, with intravenous uh, insulin therapy and maintaining glucose level at 7.8 to 10 millimolar per liter. Also, glucose concentration less than 6 millimol per liter in a diabetic patient especially is not recommended. How about hemoglobin concentration? What is the target of concentration? Anemia causes activation of compensatory physiologic, cardiovascular and cellular mechanisms to optimize uh, tissue oxygen delivery. And this including uh, increased cardiac output, preferential blood flow to the brain, and induction of neuronal nitrogoxine synthase, which is vasodilator and produce increasing flux of blood to the brain. So cellular responses to anemia are enhancement of angiogenesis, promotion of promotion of erythropoiesis increase in cellular glucose and prompting of glycolytic anaerobic metabolism if aerobic is inaccessible. Despite the activation of this potent responses, tissue oxygen tension in the brain decreases in proportion to the hemoglobin level. When this mechanism become overwhelmed and uh, fail. So some previous reports, as I read, uh, showed that packet red blood cell transfusion in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients with initial hemoglobin of 8 resulted in brain tissue uh, oxygen improvement. Other important fact is uh, level of anemia corresponding to hemoglobin 
a level below 11 gram per deciliter was shown to be associated with increased morbidity. And in other large retrospective studies, hemoglobin concentration less than 11 gram per deciliter 11 uh, gram per deciliter was an independent risk factor for symptomatic uh, postoperative cerebral spasm, especially in patients with spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Also, anemia is associated with poor neurologic outcome, especially in the presence of cerebral ischemia. So, the target is more than 11. And we are going to the last slide, which is anesthetic agents, volatile and intravenous anesthetics, of course. So anesthetics may have temporary cerebrodynamic benefits in decreasing cerebral metabolism, intracranial pressure and brain volume. Anesthetic preconditioning is a phenomenon of transient organ exposure to anesthetic clinical concentrations that triggers endogenous cellular neuroprotective processes neuroprotective processes similarly anesthetic uh, post conditioning describes uh, neuroprotection inducing by introducing short episodes of anesthetic exposure during the early phase of reperfusion after a prolonged episode of ischemia and the new drug like Inhalatory anesthetic like xenon, which is uh, recently uh, re-emerged as an anesthetic agent, uh, with a presumed mechanism, which is competitive inhibition of NMDA receptor. Xenon suppresses the increase in uh, intraneuronal calcium concentration, thus preventing cell death. So suppresses calcium release and preventing thus cell death. Once again, we can review brain protection in neurosurgery. We have many mechanisms, but mild hypothermia, ad uh, maintain adequate blood pressure, even induced arterial hypertension for collateral vascular uh, binding, normal glycemia, and target hemoglobin concentration like more than 11 gram per deciliter, and using specific uh, anesthetics that are protective for brain all of them help in in some way for protecting uh, neurons thank you for your watching and have a great time guys